As Reverend Ingram mentioned a few moments ago, next week indeed is Commitment Sunday. A time during our stewardship season when we joyfully bring to church a commitment that our own family makes. A commitment we make to support the work and ministry to which God has called us as River Road Church. You may have noticed during our stewardship season that while normally we have in worship testimonies from the laity, from you, regarding uh, your own family's call to stewardship in, in this place, We've instead this year utilized some testimonies from our church staff members. And that is not to indicate, of course, that stewardship is simply a matter for the ministers at River Road Church. But what we have intended to do this year is to highlight some of the ways that we believe God is calling us to dream, to stretch, to expand some of the ministries that we are doing. In previous stewardship seasons, you have made significant investments. Investments in this wonderful church staff that we have been able to call. And this time around, this year, we ask you again to, to stretch, to prayerfully consider how your own family might give so that we can equip our wonderful ministry staff with resources they need to carry out the ministry to which God and we have called them. So as you return next week with your pledge cards, please do so prayerfully. And please know how we your church leadership are so grateful for the generous and sacrificial gifts that you bring. Thank you, church. Is there anything worse than when you have a wonderful joke to tell someone and someone else standing nearby steals your thunder. You got a really funny joke to tell and just when you're about to land the punchline, someone spoils it for you. Okay, so there maybe are some things worse than that in this world, but that's got to rank up there. When it happens to me, it drives me bananas. It's, it's like I, all the rest of the day, I have this itch right in the middle of my back that I can't reach. And it just drives me crazy. And, and as I was studying this lesson from Luke last week, it dawned on me that this is exactly what Luke does to Jesus. He steals the punchline right at the beginning. Most of the time when Jesus tells a story, of course, it seems like he likes to let the punchline sneak up on us. As he's telling a story, whether it's the prodigal son or the good Samaritan or one of my favorites, the story of the workers in the vineyard, you're following along with Jesus' tale, nodding your head and enjoying the narrative. And, and as, as Bill Tuck puts in one of his most recent books, The Difficult Sayings of Jesus, when the ending comes, more times than not, we walk away scratching our head, feeling like we've just been had. Another one of my mentors in ministry says, you've probably understood the gist of Jesus' parable when you say to yourself, I think I know what he means, 
and I don't think I like it. That's what normally happens when we come to the parables of Jesus. But on this occasion, Luke spills the beans right at the beginning. Before Jesus even opens his mouth, Luke tells us what all of it means. Then, says Luke, Jesus tells them a parable about their need to pray always and not lose heart. So right off the bat, we know that this is going to be a parable about prayer. But I do think there is a classic Jesus twist here. Because if you think that this is going to be a story about sweet and simplistic prayer, then you're going to be mistaken. Because just before this parable, Jesus has delivered some rather scary words about the end of time. On that night, Jesus says, all will be usual, people eating, drinking, getting married, but then two will be in bed and one will be taken, the other will be left. There will be two women grinding meal together, one will be taken, the other will be left. The disciples start to look around and say, when will this happen? Where will it take place? Instead of answering them directly, Jesus tells them this story. So with that as the background, we can imagine that this will not be some nice little story about prayer for sunshine after the rain. Or one of those prayers we have all all have prayed right before the big test and we didn't study quite as much as we should have. No, we expect that what Jesus is talking about is the kind of prayer that we experience when the world is crashing in. When there's evil and, just, and injustice all around us. And when we fall to our needs and plead with God to come, come quickly and set things right. This is about desperate prayer. About begging for God to show up and to deliver us. This kind of prayer, if I might say so, church, is is rather dangerous. I say it's dangerous because it puts your faith in God and everything you believe, it puts it all on the line. He rises early every single morning to pray for his wife. She's been taking these medicines. The doctors call it experimental, but he's, he's really hoping they work. He prays every morning that the medicines will slow her cognitive decline. But this morning, as he goes into their bedroom to wake her up for the day, she doesn't even recognize him. She prays morning, noon, and evening, all day really. Lord, keep him safe. End this war soon. Bring my son back safely. But one morning, as she's having her coffee and reading the newspaper, she looks out the front window and sees two gentlemen in uniform coming up the front sidewalk. One of them is a chaplain. Ma'am, We regret to inform you that do you see what I mean? This kind of prayer is dangerous. It's done many people in. They cast their prayers off into the distance and only hear silence in return. Can you blame them for wondering what's the point of all this? Is anyone there? Is anyone listening to me? Have you been there?
Jesus knows this can happen. That's why he tells us this story. It's a story involving two characters. The first is a judge. In Jesus' day, judges were very powerful, and their rulings were final. Judges were the epitome of wisdom and fairness. At least, that's what you would hope for if you ever found yourself in court. And Jesus says there appears before this judge a widow, someone at the very bottom of society, lacking all status and power, vulnerable to every kind of abuse. She stands before the judge. For what reason, we don't really know. Jesus doesn't tell us. But we do know that she is desperate for justice, for vindication. She wants things to be set right. Heartbreakingly, this this widow, this desperate woman, has found herself standing before a judge who himself is unjust and who, by his own admission, quote, has no fear of God and no respect for anyone else. Not the kind of judge I'd want to stand in front of. Clearly no justice will be found here. She's just another poor widow at the bottom of the heap who's tying up his court docket with her annoying appeals for justice. But this woman is wonderfully stubborn. She will not be dismissed. She refuses to go away and she will not take no for an answer. She knows what she wants, what she needs, And she knows this judge is the only one who can give it to her. So she keeps coming before this judge and keeps asking for what she needs until she gets it. Give me justice. Do your job, she cries. Dismiss me today. I'll come back tomorrow. Give me justice. The judge finally gives in. This widow pesters him long enough that he finally breaks and gives her the justice she needs. Then Jesus says, won't God do the same for you? Jesus indicates to us that there's incredible power in this kind of persistent prayer. Do you know the name Edward Bennett Williams? It's a name from the past, for sure. He was a legendary Washington criminal lawyer. At one time, he owned the Washington Redskins and the Baltimore Orioles. And in his legal career, he had represented such varied characters as Frank Sinatra, Jimmy Hoffa, and Richard Nixon, among many others. In a biography of Williams, the story is told that Mother Teresa once visited Mr. Williams in his law office. She was raising money for an AIDS hospice ministry, and Williams was in charge of a charitable foundation that Mother Teresa had hoped would fund the hospice ministry. Before she arrived for the appointment, Williams said to his partner, Paul Dietrich, You know, Paul, I I really don't care much for AIDS as a charitable cause. Makes me uncomfortable. I don't really want to make this contribution, but I've got this Catholic saint coming to see me, and I don't know what to do. After talking about it for a while, they decided that they would be polite, tell her no, and then escort her out. So Mother Teresa arrived. The author of William's biography states that Mother Teresa was almost like a little sparrow on the other side of that large mahogany desk from this prominent attorney. 
She made her appeal for the hospice, and William said, as he had rehearsed, we're very touched by your appeal, but the answer is no. Mother Teresa simply said, let us pray. William looked at Dietrich, and they bowed their heads quickly in prayer. After the prayer, Mother Teresa made the exact same pitch that she had made just a minute before, word for word for her hospice ministry. Again, William said politely, no thank you. So Mother Teresa said, let us pray. <laughs> Exasperated, William said, all right, all right, I'll get my checkbook. Now, I don't think Jesus tells us this story to indicate that, that we ought to just simply annoy God over and over. And if we would just annoy God enough, God will give in and grant to us what we want. I don't think that's the point. What Jesus is saying, I think, is that when it seems like you're getting nowhere, don't stop. Don't give up. When you're just about to lose heart and give in, that's the time you need to pray like there's no tomorrow. When it seems as if your prayers are getting nowhere, that's the time you get out of bed and get on your knees in God's presence and you demand justice. Why? Because Jesus says, if a poor widow with absolutely no standing can wrangle justice out of an unjust judge... How much more will God give to you? For you are God's child. Real prayer, it's, it's urgent. It's confident. It's bold enough to cry out for justice in an unjust world. This kind of praying is pray for what we know we need. And when we know who can provide it. <clears throat> Barbara Brown Taylor, a favorite author of many of you, was talking with her granddaughter, Madeline, about this very subject, about prayer. Madeline told her grandmother that she didn't really think prayer worked. She said to Barbara, last year I prayed that my best friend wouldn't move away, but she did. And this year I prayed that mommy and daddy would get back together, but that didn't happen either. Barbara says, I wanted to tell Madeline this, that the best thing about prayer is the relationship. Whether or not we get what we ask for, we keep asking. I want her to pester God the way she pesters her mother, thinking of 12 different ways to plead her case. I want her to long for God the same way she longs for her father holding fast to him even when his chair at the dining room table is empty. And Barbara says, when she complains that none of this does any good, I'm going to ask her to tell me the difference between how she feels while she's praying compared with how she feels when she thinks about giving up. And if I'm lucky... She's going to tell me that she feels more alive, more in love when she is praying. And that's when I'll tell her the story about the persistent widow. Just like Jacob at the River Jabbok in our Old Testament lesson for today, when we pray 
when we pray this way, we, we wrestle with God and we refuse to give in to the night. We refuse to give in to despair, to hopelessness. We wrestle with God and we demand a blessing. I think the point of this parable is simply to encourage us to continue praying. We pray daily because we have needs daily. Prayer is embracing the God who loves us and knows our needs even before we ask. And prayer acknowledges that our greatest need is for God. Church, I know it's hard sometimes, but we must keep at it. We pray because Jesus promises that God will hear us and that God, Emmanuel, will always, always, always be with us.